Bom dia a todos. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Scholars Week of PPJ and Up 2023. It's very good to be able to be here with you and to bring our guests, international guests, our partners, to discuss a little bit about democracy, accountability, and the state of things we are in. This speech of today is the first action of a partnership that INAP is establishing with Ohio State University. And here with us today, we have Jane, Jane Aparecido, who is our major partner, our major companion in the establishment of this partnership. Jane, I'm speaking English, but she speaks Portuguese. Would you like to talk to us a little bit about this partnership? Of course, it's going to be a pleasure. First, thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity. Uh, for We're represented by Professor Roders Yad Shelders. I hope you like the presentation pretty much. I am Jane, I'm director at the office of Ohio State University here in Brazil. Some universities of the United States have offices in Brazil, so it's always easy to have a possibility for a partnership between the institutions. Uh, between Amongst the things we do here at the Ohio State University office in Brazil, the support for Brazilian students interested in going to Ohio State, do research or study something. I also help students from Ohio State to come to Brazil have internships in Brazil, study something related to Portuguese or Brazilian culture. We also help professors from Ohio State to connect to Brazilian professors, to do research, to publish uh, things together. I think it's within this uh, coming closer between Ohio State and Enape. Today is the first activity of this approximation and I hope many others come further on, like opportunity for research, joint courses, sending and reception of students between the institutions and I'm at your disposal to help in this whole process. Thank you very much once again. I thank you, Jane, uh, for our students. This afternoon we'll have a tour, in-person tour in at ENAP. It will be very good to be able to welcome you here and show our structure to you. And some of the activities foreseen uh, are exactly to have a talk about international partnerships that INAP has been establishing, the potentialities for whoever should want to take a course abroad or for the ones who are thinking of uh, a uh, sandwich in case of the doctorate the students. So we have some universities that are pretty interesting in the United States and England with which we have already uh, established contact and uh, matured this relationship. And it's worth for the ones thinking and spending some time abroad and take courses in other universities. We will uh, provide you with these tips, uh, but you didn't come here to listen to me. You came for the speech from Professor Rad Skelders, and now is the time to bring him uh, here. Professor, please. You have the floor, sir, and here he is. Professor Rad Skelders will make the presentation. Sorry, Professor, she wasn't passing the floor. He will make the presentation for the ones interesting in the presentation and, and the paper that he kindly shared with us. We will send you uh, right after the presentation. We'll make the paper available for the ones registered. So if you weren't able to register, run and to INAP's website, send your information because anyhow, it's now or never. Professor? Um, thank you, sir. Uh, students, yours. colleagues, welcome this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity to do a presentation at ANAP, which I understand is the Brazilian equivalent to the French Ecole Nationale d'Administration. Um, 
I have um, had the privilege of having had a lot of programs that I started doing already at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands when I worked there, uh, running and developing and teaching programs for mid-career uh, folks working in the public sector. So military, police, diplomats, elected office holders, and your uh, career civil servants, middle and upper level. Uh, and um, so this is a lot of fun to do. Um, I wrote a presentation for this morning and I was informed that um, I have about an hour followed by two hours of questions and answers. So you can grill me <laughs> quite a bit. And I had to remind, I, I remembered the exams in the, uh, graduate school, what Americans call graduate school, that was the master's program at the University of Leiden, uh, where I did my master's in history, and exams were always oral exams, one and a half hours with three professors. By the time you were done, you went on a blasting headache. But anyway, I'm not going to get that today, and I do look forward to your questions. I practiced my talk today. My text is quite a bit longer, and there are two elements to the text. The first part I will read up, so I'm not always looking in this, at the screen, but we'll be looking at my text. The second part, the first part is then a reflection upon um, the challenges democracy faces, right? The second part is a more scholarly text <clears throat> that lays out a conceptual framework for things we could think about when we're trying to understand what's happening with democracy and what government's capacity is to deal with problems in society at large uh, in the context of a democracy. So um, can we start the PowerPoint, please? Excellent, thank you. And you can go to the second PowerPoint now. Yeah, that's it. As you can see, I have a few quotes and I'll refer to those in the course of the text itself not necessarily in my presentation, but I think those uh, capture quite nicely some of the problems that we have with democracy in uh, uh, democratic societies. The last one uh, I had to think a little uh, about, for me, democracies and abusive statistics, the Argentinian poet and novelist uh, Jorge Borges, but what he means is that in a democracy, the majority rules. And what if the majority is 51%? Yeah, that's what he meant with abuse of statistics. Anyway, I'm going to uh, go into my uh, lecture. Growing up, I had no idea it was in a democracy. We celebrated Liberation Day in the Netherlands on May 5th, the end of National Socialist occupation in the country of my birth and nationality. In our family, it was celebrated, even though the young ones, myself included, did not know about the holes in my mother's legs because of starvation during the winter months of 44, 45, and did not know about my father being shipped home from a German labor camp after two and a half years of work because he could no longer walk. Is ignorance a bliss? Yes. For the young ones, regarding almost all issues, lessons, and challenges of life, the only exception for those young ones is that they will learn, actually will have to learn, that caring for and sharing with others based on a sense of reciprocity and fairness is central to the survival of humanity. Obviously, that is done through example and through challenges and issues big in the eye of the child. What about democracy and the rule of law? Is that too big of an idea for a child? Is it even too big of an idea for an adult? Is democracy in general such a big idea? that we're only beginning to understand what it takes to succeed? What can and should we do that sit to assure that citizens understand the position and role of government in democratic societies and why that position and role are different from most historical governments? Being a professor, you will not be surprised that in my view, education is indispensable. Education in civics and ethics at universities is good, but not sufficient. But fortunately, a curriculum has been developed for grades one to 12 the um, by the Educating for American Democracy Initiative, which in my view is very useful for education in any democracy. Education in civics and ethics is as important as reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
allow me to go back to that comment about caring for and sharing with others as important for the survival of humanity. Indeed, collaboration is so important that it is deeply embedded in humanity's genetic and psychological makeup. In fact, without these, we most likely would not have survived amid animals with greater speed or with fearsome teeth or with longer claws and who have the advantage of proceeding on all fours rather than being bipedal, which exposes our most vulnerable body parts. We survived through collaboration and encephalization, and thus we developed the capacity to accumulate the experiences and pass them on to the next generation. Third slide, please. PowerPoint. Third PowerPoint, please. Yeah. Just consider this fact. While our species exists for some 200 to 300,000 years, it is only about 6,000 years ago that the need was felt to institutionalize formal arrangements for governing the imagined community they were part of. A few were considered or considered themselves as leaders. The rest followed like herd-like animals, as subjects. It is puzzling that after a few hundred thousand years of some degree of egalitarianism, humanity so quickly shifted to hierarchically organized social relations. Even when Pericles in his funeral speech in 431 before the common era mentioned democracy, it was only a political dream in ancient Athens, relevant to adult males, not to women and slaves. It was certainly never conceived as something that could be possible in jurisdictions with multiple cities, let alone in large territories with layered jurisdictions from the local to the upper regional level. And yet, almost 2,500 years later, the Atlantic revolutions happened, and they were revolutions, not prolonged transitions. And people in the United States and France established the basis for an experiment in large-scale democracy. I say experiment, because despite all our assumed intelligence, we have not quite figured out what it is that makes democracy successful. After the Second World War, it appeared democracy was on the rise across the globe. And these decades also happened to be the years that income inequality declined significantly for the first time in history. By the time that Fukuyama declared democracy to be the pinnacle of what civilization could achieve, oh, goodness. hang on, could achieve, I had messed up my pages, I apologize. <laughs> uh, its decline had already begun. With the rise of populism and populist parties on the right and the left in many democracies, and with its concomitant emphasis on populist politics that pursues policies aimed at harnessing one party's raw power by exploiting and fanning the voters' fears and prejudices, rather than developing a responsible politics that pursues policy with an eye on the needs of the people at large. We must wonder why democracy appears so fragile. Mettler and Lieberman identified four threats to democracy, political polarization, conflict about who belongs in society, and you will understand that this refers to the influx of refugees and immigrants uh, to the Western world, rising income inequality, and aggrandizement of the executive over the other two branches of government. Now, we may have a separation of powers, but there are countries where the executive tries to overpower the legislature and the judiciary. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So far, I think several necessary conditions can be identified that are important to democracy uh, and its success. But I have not found in the literature, nor in my own boundedly rational thoughts, anything that comes close to being a sufficient condition. For lack of a sufficient condition, 
I'll proceed by suggesting to you a few necessary conditions, offer some definitions of government, and then I will focus on the condition as on one condition as it concerns the need that people have for government and governance when living in imagined communities. Can I have the next PowerPoint, please? Yeah, thank you. Some necessary conditions for democracy to thrive would include self-restraint, and that self-restraint on the part of the individual as well as on the part of government. Okay? The kind of self-restraint that allegedly John Stuart Mill expressed when he said, my freedom to punch you stops at your nose. So when I restrain my urges, you are free. Second, the recognition that the individual can only thrive as part of the community. This is what Alexis de Tocqueville called self-interest properly understood and what Nelson Mandela in the Zosa language called Ubuntu. Third, that we accept the authority of government as a neutral arbiter in any conflict. Fourth, that we expect citizens and public officials to have knowledge about the position and role of government in democratic societies. Fifth, that citizens accept and expect government to act upon their interests. Sixth, to accept and expect that citizens accept the lead of government in collective issues that cannot be resolved by nonprofit or private actors. Seventh, knowing that all public authority is negotiable. Yeah. Now you recall Max Weber's distinction between traditional charismatic and legal rationality and authority. And I think there's such a thing as negotiable authority because no laws in Western countries are set in stone. And laws, even constitutions, will be adapted to changing economic, social, cultural, political, and so forth circumstances. That's what I meant with negotiable. And then finally, that, and that's really important, knowing that in democracy, people who act in the public interest can be held accountable. The next slide, please, PowerPoint. So there are three concepts in this listing of necessary conditions that I think require definition. That is government, governance, and accountability. So you'll see on your uh, screen, the PowerPoint, the first definition. That's what I came up with when Richard Stillman and I were preparing uh, an edited volume of um, syllabi and course descriptions that we had uh, designed for public administration review in the electronic uh, format. And um, so this first definition that you see there is one that in my view um, is relevant to any historical and contemporary government, whether democratic or authoritarian. But then a few years later, I came to realize that I need a little more specification because most historical governments were authoritarian. So I needed to have a definition that captured that period in time. And that's the second definition there. And then I realized a page later that, wait a minute, in democracy, things, at least in terms of political theory, are supposed to work a little different. Hence, the third definition. And that's a definition that is relevant to democratic societies only. The next slide, please, PowerPoint. So we can see that various definitions of government are possible. And I only gave three that I had yeah, for three different, to describe three different aspects of government. So government uh, in human society, the first one, government in authoritarian systems and government in democratic systems, right? Um, uh, and each of those definitions emphasize an important point. Now, when we differentiate government from governance, it is clear why only government is the public actor with the authority to make binding decisions for all living in the jurisdiction. While government, while governance refers to all those actors in society that contribute to society's governing, and that is both the public, the nonprofit and the private sectors. There are various organizations and institutions in society that are not public, yet contribute to the governance of society. I'm sure you can easily find examples in Brazil. 
but consider, among others, organized religion, labor unions, political parties, guilds, and so on. The last concept that requires attention in democratic political systems is that of accountability. This has the same etymological root as accounting, which is accounting eh, to produce accounts of properties or money, and being answerable and being held liable uh, to be called into account to someone or something. You will have noticed in the above three definitions, maybe implicitly, that I distinguish between three ages of government, and each can be related to accountability. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, PowerPoint? Excellent. For most of our existence during prehistory and the very early sedentary state, stage, there was a government among people in a physical community. And accountability was possible because of direct face-to-face -face interaction between all members of the band. Once formal institutional arrangements for government were established, it became a government above society with the people as subjects living in an imagined community. The state was perceived as a property of the ruler and the supporting ruling elite, and people were subjects. This started about 6,000 years ago, I mentioned that, and lasted at least until 1800 of the Common Era. After that, some territories experienced extensive reform of their public institutional arrangements that resulted in a society, in a government, in a society by, for, and with the people as citizens. The state, at least in terms of political theory, became the property of the people. In practice, though, it is still to a large degree controlled by the economically wealthy and the politically powerful. So in the first age of government, governing, accountability was based on direct social control and characterized by reciprocity, sharing, and a very strong sense of fairness. These characteristics are deeply embedded in our primate DNA and psychological makeup. In the second age of governing, uh, subjects were held accountable as taxpayers. Those who ruled could only be held accountable via popular art, uh, uprising, prompted when the tax burden, burden had risen, not above the lips, but above the eyeballs. For most of history, people were governed by a ruler who was supported by a governing elite drawn from the aristocracy who occupied leadership positions in the military, the priesthood, in trade, and the bureaucracy. The state and its government were literally the property of the ruler. Sovereignty was physically embodied in the person of the ruler. However, from the early 17th century on, scholars came to see government less as an instrument of power in the hands of some, and more as a container and enabler than a advance the common wheel of the population. In the third age of government, that of democracy, all actors in society can be held accountable. Citizens as taxpayers and as sovereign. Elected office holders as representatives and trustees slash guardians of the common good. And career civil servants as experts and as servants of the people and servants of elected office holders. That is when accountability becomes a much more complex phenomenon for various reasons. From whose perspective do we look at accountability? As a citizen, as an elected official, or a career civil servant? A citizen should ask, are you political office holder, civil servant, competent, honest, and act with integrity? An elected official should ask, will you, Citizen, civil servant, accept and respect my leadership, knowing that I act in good faith? And the civil servant should ask, do you, political office holder, trust my professionalism and expertise? In the study of public administration, there are various ways uh, of assessing accountability, and I list those in the paper. And you can think about short-term focus on output, a longer-term focus on uh, outcome and balancing economy efficiency and effectivity on the one hand with democracy, fairness, due process, 
and equity on the other hand. So efficiency and democracy, that's a difficult balance for government and democracies to maintain. Now, citizens are accountable to one another, right? Um, but for public servants, accountability is a little more complex. In one of his farewell lectures, Dwight Waldo, a professor at the Maxwell School at Syracuse University in the state of New York, listed several uh, yeah, people and elements that people in the public sector could be held accountable to. And that listing includes the people, the constitution, law in general, God. Are you first and foremost, it's another one, loyal to yourself? Are you loyal to family? to democracy, to humanity, to the president or the prime minister, to the highest organizational executive officer in your department or agency, the director and administrator, or are you loyal to the profession you are trained in? That's quite a list. And we can easily see that public service emphasize set some and have less consideration for other elements. Fortunately, although admitted, um, not assuredly, there are controls in place to hold democratic governments politically and administratively accountable. Next PowerPoint, please. Yeah, thank you. So there are internal controls and mechanisms which, which would include policy evaluation, different types, all sorts of types of audits, financial reports. You could actually decide to uh, terminate an agency or department when its services are no longer necessary and oversight of career civil servants by colleagues and elected officials. External controls I've listed there on my paper, um, and they include citizen oversight, participatory budgeting, which I believe is something that has also been used in Brazil, public opinion, opinion service, uh, surveys, ethics codes and standards of conduct. These external controls are characteristic for democracy, which as a large scale experiment was not tried until the American founding fathers institutionalized a, a separation of powers so that public authority is not concentrated in one hand, which was historically the case, right? B, checks and balances so that each branch of government controls has controls over the other two and C, protection against government overreach. And that effort can only succeed under respect for human rights, respect for the rule of law, accepting the notion that elections have been free and fair, and accepting that political and market competition are normal. And you will appreciate the notion, huh? Robert Mickles, the iron law of oligarchy, that money and power tend to flow to the center. And democracy tries to break that up. Now, what has happened to democracy since the 1980s? People in general have a short attention span, and COVID-19 may have disrupted the world, but it's only a suddenly emerging natural phenomenon that can be treated with medication and appropriate behavior. More disruptive, but also more insidious, is the anti-democratic sentiment that has crawled from under the rocks in many countries. It is amazing to see how quickly democratic institutional arrangements for administration and governance can be placed under stress by the rather crazy actions of one person who seeks to hold on to power, by politicians who wish to secure power by any means, but lack the charisma of the leader, and by political leaders and parties feeding on sentiments of anger and uncertainty. Regarding country leaders, on the right side of the political spectrum, we can think of President Erdogan of Turkey, President Putin of Russia, Prime Minister Orban of Hungary, former and current Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, former Brazilian President Bolsonaro, Prime Minister Modi in India, former American President Trump, and of this challenge of Marine Le Pen in the runoff uh, for the presidency of France with Macron. On the left side of the political spectrum, we can find former President Hugo Chavez of Venezuela and former and current President Lula da Silva of Brazil. Next PowerPoint, please. Thank you. 
What connects right-wing individuals is that they reject, and you can read it there, in words and actions, democratic rules of the game, that they deny uh, the legitimacy of their opponents, that they encourage or tolerate violence, and that there isn't a willingness to curtail the civil liberties of opponents, and including those in the media. And you can add to that, uh, they engage in promissory politics, and they seek to create a following that adoringly accepts anything from the leader. And you will appreciate that I have that added in German there, Führer, right? I'm not aware of left-wing individuals going so far as to fully embrace these six features. Regarding political parties, many democracies have seen the ascendance of pop populist right-wing parties for various reasons, but certainly including the sense that the influx of refugees and immigrants leads to a greatly changed... Hey! Sorry, my screen disappeared for a second. A greatly increased... Um, lead to a greatly changed demographic that challenges in the eyes of some the identity of their country. It has even been argued that there is a global struggle between autocracy and democracy. With regard to the United States, for a long time, Americans perceived their country as the city upon the hill, the country, the first country to experiment with large-scale democracy. However, Americans have become to say the least, complacent about the strength of their democracy. Then, in 2009, 2010, there was the emergence of the Tea Party, drawing the old GOP further to the right. And as you will hear later from me in this presentation, that is actually something that started back in the 1950s. Then, this was followed in 2016 by the election of Donald Trump, who, during his term of office, office challenged American democracy and strained the relationships between democratic countries. Then there was January 6, 2021, and in Brasilia, January 8, 2023, seared in the minds of many. This was not only an event where democracy's strength was put under stress. It was also one where democracy was claimed to be protected by those who want to hold on to power. It is amazing to me that in the last five decades, some Republicans have moved away from the notion that democracy can only survive by exercising self-restraint. And in all fairness, I must add, Democrats have done the same in the past. Instead, Republicans have been unabashed and unashamed in the process, in their pursuit of power by various legal and extra-legal means, such as redistricting, Next PowerPoint, please, by the way. Thank you. Such as redistricting, limiting voting access, packing courts with conservative judges, supporting lies and innuendos about the security of elections, destroying safeguards of free and fair elections, and by embracing the independent state legislature doctrine that denies state courts oversight over elections. You remember? that effort of the executive to aggrandize itself at the price of the judiciary and the legislature. President Trump pursued politics simply for personal interest. And it is astonishing to see the extent to which political office holders in his own party support his lies simply because he has such a large voter base and seemingly assures um, access to ample campaign funds in the pursuit of politics for power. And I have to add, he does not seem to share with his own party much of the campaign funds he has received from individual donors. This voter base of people who feel threatened by this sense of losing their country helps perhaps, under, perhaps understand the pussyfooting of the Republican Party officials around anything that concerns Trump. We need distance in time before we can reconstruct what Trumpism did to democracy, but there are already several studies and ideas available and references you can find in the paper. Quite frankly, it's scary to see how easily power grabs for personal interest can outclass policy pursuits for the benefit of all people. 
Does this mean that democratic institutional arrangements are not strong enough to withstand authoritarian power grabs? The coming years will tell. An answer is not possible yet. Generally, the coronavirus pandemic had resulted in strong increases in government power and in various cases undermined democratic rights in the effort to assure appropriate response to a health challenge. Specific to the USA is that existing political tensions have been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic, but one could also argue that the COVID pandemic has been used to drive existing divisions in society deeper than ever before. It is these political tensions in American society that help rank the USA, according to the Economist survey, among the so-called flawed democracies since 2016. How can we understand this political sectarianism in American society and this openly hostile anti-democratic behavior on the part of the GOP at present? If there's one thing that many citizens in Brazil and the United States have learned during the past five years, it is that they cannot take democracy for granted. In fact, a variety of authors have noted that democracy appears to be in retreat. What it means to be a citizen and grow and live in a democracy is something that is generally not taught in schools beyond, if even that, the civics that focuses on how a bill becomes a law and the three branches of government. Now, in the remainder of my presentation this morning, I will present briefly a conceptual framework that helps us to assess government capacity to provide citizens with policies and services they need under the situation of an eroding or at least challenged democracy. Now, I will focus at some length on the uh, psychological and emotional makeup of human beings, because that is something that is generally not very well known uh, in uh, the social sciences. And then my attention will shift briefly to the institutional superstructure of democracy, to the ideational substructure of democracy, and to what it takes to hold actors in uh, democratic societies, public actors, public sector actors accountable for their actions. At the conclusion of the paper, I simply will recap that uh, conceptual framework, but I'll leave that to the paper and I won't go in any detail on that. Next slide, please. So there you have an outline of what I plan to present. So the ideational superstructure, and I touch upon a few elements of that, but only briefly, the ideational substructure, that is more characteristic for the United States, but I think you will be able to translate it for yourself to how it is relevant to Brazil or how you would characterize Brazil. And then I need to remind people that governments have been not just uh, responsive, but extremely flexible and adaptive to changing times. And that is especially the case at the local level on both sides of the Atlantic in the latter few decades of the 19th and the earliest decades of the 20th century. And I want to remind people of that because that happened under democracy. And it happened because that institutional superstructure had changed so fundamentally around uh, in the decades around the 1800s. Next slide, please. Or PowerPoint. Yeah. Society and community are artificial, as Bertrand Russell, Herbert Simon, and Benedict Anderson pointed out. So the institutional arrangements for governing are artificial. They reflect human nature, as was aptly pointed out by Jefferson, by Madison in Federalist 51. Many of the analyses of democracy focus on reactions of institutional actors in the public, private, and nonprofit realms. But given that institutional arrangements within which responses manifest themselves are artificial, that is human made, the responses themselves are human. Therefore, we must first pay attention to the nature of society and its people. For most of our existence on this globe, somewhere between two and 300,000 years, Homo sapiens lived in physical communities. These communities are the size of bands with 50 up to maybe 150 people, and they all know each other. 
in the physical community, you know who to go to for food, who to go to for protection, and who to go to for mediation in a conflict between two members. It is assumed that these prehistoric communities were to lesser or larger degree egalitarian, but we'll never really know. They continued to be somewhat egalitarian for a while, when at the time of the agricultural or Neolithic transition, and it was not a revolution as Vera Gordon Child called it, it took more than 10,000 years, when people somehow learned to domesticate animals, some animals and some grains. Domestication made them to settle down. Although archeologists have found examples of human communities domesticating after settling down. Now the causality is not important. Uh, what matters is that for millennia, hum humans continue to live in small communities with little social stratification, as is illustrated by an excavation in Jezhtum, which is in uh, contemporary Turkmenistan, where everyone lived in a single room house. And why is it important? Well, there was no one living in a multi-room house, which we would now call a palace. But then some 6,000 years ago, people started living in larger and ever larger communities to the point that they became an imagined community where no one knew everyone else. It was then that people became stratified in rulers, priests, clerks, soldiers, traders, craftsmen, farmers, and slaves. It is then that formalized institutional arrangements for governing became necessary so that mediation, food gathering, and survival could continue despite the fact that face-to-face -face interaction of the human gatherer lifestyle was no longer possible. At least one evolutionary psychologist and one anthropologist uh, argued that our human mind is exceptionally well-developed for living in small-scale physical communities. Our closest primate cousins, chimpanzees and bonobos, also live in, full, in physical communities. And they fish and they break up when the group size gets too big for maintaining social relations that are established and maintained through grooming between all members of the band. Today, human beings still live in physical communities, such as the nuclear family, an extended family, a sports club, church denomination, a labor union, a neighborhood association, take your pick. But these physical communities where you know people are embedded in much larger imagined communities, such as a city, a province, a country. It is in these imagined communities of increasingly sedentary populations that formal institutional arrangements for government become necessary. Social stability in these communities cannot rely on direct social control that individuals have in physical communities. To understand the challenges of institutional arrangements for governing, we must first look at the emotional and psychological makeup of human beings. Doing so clarifies that these institutional arrangements are grounded in a rather conflicting set of inst instinctual and intentional behaviors the origins of which may go back as far as the common ancestor of the Panini, that is the bonobo and the chimpanzee, and Homo, that is us. In the words of one scholar and his co-authors, that common ancestor may have in fact possessed, and I quote, a mosaic of features. To understand what this means, we, I, I will provide you a little bit uh, illustration with stepping back in time. About two million years ago, in Western Africa, there was this small river that emerged in the countryside and it became wider and it became deeper to the point that the Panini were separated in two groups, the chimpanzees north of the Congo River and what we nowadays call bonobos south of the Congo River. Isn't it interesting to know that chimpanzee uh, communities are male dominated societies with strong checks and balances where the individuals are fairly aggressive and cheat. Why? Well, the chimpanzees had to compete for food sources with gorillas. The contrast with the Panini, the bonobos south of the Congo River could not be bigger. They are female led societies. 
characterized by empathy, caring, cooperation, and sexuality for both pleasurable and conflict-resolving reasons. Human behavior, instinctually triggered or intentionally motivated, is still characterized by the mosaic of features, the quote I did earlier, as St. Augustine noted in the 5th century of the Common Era. And you can look at the list on the PowerPoint. Huh? Uh, we, are, we have in ourselves both collectivist and individualist tendencies. We're egalitarian, but we're also he uh, hierarchical. We can be altruistic, we can be selfish. We can conform or we emphasize our uniqueness. We can be impulsive, we can be rational. And those things are part of human nature. And where we fall depends upon the situation and the individual we're interacting with. Now, especially the organization of chimpanzee bands merits attention, as there are two types of alliances between individuals that we see mirrored in human institutional arrangements for governing. In the so-called rank-changing alliance, a male depends upon supporters to get into power and hold on to a position of power. This helps understand why someone like Kim Jong-un or like Vladimir Putin can stay in power. However, should the dominant male consume more resources than he needs and thus harm the group, a leveling alliance of several lower ranking males will form a coalition that restricts or even deposes of the dominant male. This has happened plenty of times with monarchs, dictators, and leaders throughout history. So a rank-changing alliance, and that's a term that is used by primatologists, is what keeps authoritarians in power. A leveling alliance is what brings them down. The human institutional arrangements for democracy are characteristic of a leveling alliance also known in the primatology literature as reverse dominance hierarchy, which balances the need for hierarchy with the equally important need for checks and balances between fragmented sources and branches of power. What differentiates the rank changing alliance from the leveling alliance is that public nonprofit and private actors in the leveling alliance can access, participate in, and have influence upon public policy making. Thus, politics and governing in autocratic and authoritarian systems are characterized by high centralization and therefore hierarchy, kind of like chimpanzee societies, while democratic systems are characterized by a politics and governance where there are a variety of organizational, institutional, and individual act, uh, actors swirling around in a cauldron of preferences. Next PowerPoint, please. Excellent, thank you. So there are several moving parts in the institutional superstructure of democracy, right? And I will single out three of these, and I'm sure we can come up with more. So there are institutions and organizations, there's human actors and agency, and there's the political party system. Now, characteristic for democracy, and I see I have about 10 minutes left, so that's good. Um, characteristic for democracy is that we have separated the branches of power. And when I say that in, uh, in class, uh, just think of Pharaoh in ancient Eden, Egypt. Pharaoh was the, high, the head of state. He was the head of government. He was the high priest. He was the highest military commander. He was the highest in pretty much everything you can imagine. And all that combined in one person. Uh, Thomas Hobbes argued for the same after seven years of civil war in England, recognizing that, wait a minute, if we don't concentrate all public authority in the hands of one, an absolute monarch, <coughs> the alternative is anarchy, where one wolf is a wolf to the other. Also characteristic for the institutional superstructure in democracies is that to varying degrees in varying country, in a variety of countries, there is collaboration between public, nonprofit, and private sector actors in the delivery of public services. In the US, that has come to be called by my friend Bob Durant, the compensatory state, where nonprofit and private actors compensate 
poor, defected government cannot provide everything. And this happens especially at local levels. Now, as I said, this is the case to varying degrees in other countries as well, but that would require a little more empirical research. Then um, a second element that is important is that there are many individuals and groups active in and around public organizations, in democracies. Right? It's much less hierarchical, as I argued earlier. So in government, we have, in the public sector, we have people working who are elected into public office. We have political appointees, and political appointees are especially virulent in the United States. Thousands upon thousands of them, much, much more than in any other democracy that I know of. There are career civil servants who, and these three groups are pretty steady within uh, government. That is, political appointees only serving as long as the one who appointed them is in office. Then there are a variety of policy professionals and political advisors working inside government, but appointed to support a cabinet minister or the prime minister or the president, right? And then there are so many more people working around government trying to influence public policy. So there are lobbyists. We all know those. You have them everywhere. There are contractors and grant employees. And there is a variety of organizations where people uh, provide services that supplement similar type services in um, working in the public sector. And as an example, in the United States, there are, and this is of 2019, about 900,000 uniformed police officers, right? But they are supplemented by another 2.7 million private police officers and another roughly about one and a half million security guards. I don't know what you think about these numbers, but I know that these private police forces and security guards cannot adequately be, how do you say it? That government cannot adequately assure oversight over these forces. Another element characteristic for democracy is the extent to which the political party system is fragmented. Now, for the simplicity of this presentation, I simply will distinguish between multi-party and two-party systems. Two-party systems can lead to what I have called nana nana boo, boo politics, as in, I'm going to do now to you what you did to me when you were in power. Multi-party systems, and the way I distinguish them is copied from Arndt Leipart, are what he calls a kinder and gentler form of democracies with lower incarceration rates, lower inflation rate, better control of violence, less use of the death penalty, better care of the environment, more foreign aid, and more welfare spending, health and education, for instance. And he calls them kinder and gentler forms because there's not a single party that has all power, so to speak. Next PowerPoint, and I'm close to wrapping up. Yeah. Now, the ideational substructure is what makes a country tick. And in the case of the United States, something that people share is a strong sense of individualism, right? An American in the research by Geert Hofstede, a Dutch sociologist, is ranked number one when it comes to the individualism index. But remember the Tocqueville, that no individual can thrive unless the community thrives. And that actually holds for America as well. A second element characteristic for the United States, not only, but also for other Western countries, is declining trust in government, in each other, and in institutions. Now, trust in government is generally high and stable in consensual political systems, that is, multi-party systems. So that's characteristic of, say, Canada, uh, nor, uh, Northwestern Europe, so Scandinavian countries, and I like to include my own country as well. Uh, trust in government in each other and in other institutions is less in systems with an unstable political coalition, think Italy, a dictatorial past, rising right-wing politics, and divisive partisanship. Another thing characteristic for the United States, and to a lesser extent, uh, other demo democracies, is distrust of the civil service. I don't know how many people ever heard of the Malik Manual by Frederick Malik, but he wrote in the Nixon administration, he was the head of the uh, Office of Personnel Management, a manual wherein he argued that it was to, uh, uh, important to appoint loyalists 
in the middle and upper levels of the career civil service. Loyalists, as in people loyal to you, to Ronald Reagan, or yeah, not Ronald Reagan, to uh, Richard Nixon, not to the people or the constitution. And remember that listing that I had of elements and things you could be held accountable to? So that's the Malik manual. In the same year, uh, there was um, a memorandum by Lewis Powell, who became an associate justice of the American Supreme Court, um, believing or expressing a belief that the free market was attacked, the functioning of the free market by leftists, communists, and students, and all sorts of radicals in universities and literary journals. So Americans have a deep trust in the functioning of the market, as in, when everybody works hard, all boats will rise. But wait a minute. Isn't it the case that in almost all societies, some people are more important than others? Just think of George Orwell's 1984. Some pigs are more important than others. Next slide, please. And I can guarantee you there is a lot more detail in the paper on each of these PowerPoints, but I just don't have the time. Now, things changed. Uh, since the early 17th century, people started thinking about the possibility that it would be that, it, that we should have a government that was responsible for improving the lives of all people. Antonio Serra and I hear a number of people who write increasingly that government should go beyond protection of order and safety, defense of the territory, and um, punishment in case that people violate the laws. Now, it's about the end of the 18th century that major institutional reforms in the public sector um, happen, and they come out of nowhere. And that is, I think, revolutionary. It happened in a few decades. The separation of politics and administration, separation of church and state, separation of public and private spheres of life. And in this case, that's a separation between the political sector of society, so the public, and then the economic side, the market, and a separation of office and office holders. And it is upon that basis, I've argued in my writing the last 20 years or so, that a new set of institutional arrangements and that governments around 1900, and especially local governments were able to respond adequately and flexibly to the challenges imposed by rapid urbanization and industrialization. Next PowerPoint, please. I am close to wrapping up, folks, so that there will be time next PowerPoint. Yeah. Now, let me see. Um, accountability in a democracy is not easy. And it has to do with the fact that authority is formally fragmented and officially fragmented, and that there are so many actors allowed in the policy and decision-making process. Now, politicization has been driven to a breaking point by uh, Trump and his political allies. Um, distrust in elections have become normal. Um, let me see. There is still a belief among some people that something like Hitler cannot happen in the United States. How many Americans have heard of a play in 1935, a novel, and a play in 1936 by Sinclair Lewis? It can't happen here. How many people know that the motto of Hitler's SS, and remember what I mentioned about the Malik Manual, appoint loyalists in government, that the motto of Hitler's SS was meine Ehre heißt Treue, my honor is loyalty to Hitler, not to the German people. What happened in Nazi Germany has almost happened here in America. Any authoritarian feeds upon passive passions, and those gripped by anger diminish their citizenship and reduce themselves as followers. Um, I think it is important to remember that there was a time when democracies, fledgling emerging democracies, were able to respond to citizen need and literally. Uh, responded to citizens writing letters. We know this in America, in the Netherlands, in France, writing letters, do something about the, the living conditions, about the streets, about the water supply, about the quality of housing in those rapidly urbanizing areas. Um, so that's why, that's what makes me think that that administrative capacity is still there. 
in democracies, even though there are some who try to undermine democracy. Speaking about fake news and deep state, and you have to keep in mind that the deep state originally, by Lofgren, a term, uh, referred to the fact that quite openly, all sorts of CEOs of big industries and corporations tried to influence public policy, literally by donating money to political campaigns, uh, and somewhat more covertly by trying to influence policy that would benefit their company. But deep state as a term has actually been co-opted by the Republican right wing uh, to refer to what they call the swamp that needs to be drained in Washington, D.C. No, the swamp is right wing and left wing extremists who hijack political power for themselves rather than for serving the people. So we have fake news in deep state versus facts, evidence and reason. And if you remember what I mentioned, that there are so many actors inside government and around government who try to influence it, the question becomes, who can be held accountable in a democracy? Is it that much easier to hold people accountable in an authoritarian system? Because after all, it's pretty clear who's the boss. Yeah. So the answer is not easy uh, because of reasons outlined in the, in the paper. And you can ask for yourselves whether faith in democracy is shaken or not. Well, I can tell you, as a child, I had no clue. I grew up in The Hague. I didn't know I lived in a democracy. I had heard some snippets of experiences of my parents uh, during the German occupation. That was no fun, but I took democracy for granted. I did have class in government and civics, but it was limited to what Guy Peters calls the stamps, flags, and coins of democracy. It was very descriptive. We are not in education teaching young people what it means to be a citizen. And if you look at the curriculum, I have it referenced in my paper that uh, the EAD project developed. Yes, you can teach a six-year-old about civility and civics, but at their level, and then let them grow into becoming citizens who fully know rights as well as duties. I think I'll stop here and then um, I'm welcoming questions. And hopefully, I'll have some answers. Thanks a lot, Professor Fred Skelder. Uh, certainly, we've all had much to think about. And really, uh, I was wondering whether, uh, can we, can, could you talk a little bit more about this uh, I would say a right wing change or right wing turn that we've been experiencing uh, all over the world. And I was particularly curious about how, how much does this turn to authoritarian, authoritarianism on the right wing, uh, let's say that, can be can could we uh, pin it on fake news and the deep state versions you've talked about? Okay, well, I mentioned in my presentation, huh, somewhere in the middle, uh, that it seems as if right wing populist politics emerged in the United States in uh, 2009, 2010 with the Tea Party. But then I followed up by saying that it actually goes back a lot further. And I mentioned the Malik Manual and the Powell Memorandum that I didn't know about until a few years ago in 1971. But actually the backlash against democratic politics of the New Deal of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president, right? From 1933 to 1944, um, made people in the Republican party to try and provide a counterweight to what they saw as socialist politics. So the McCarthy Red Scare in the early 1950s, yeah, the hunt for communists in film, in literature, in universities, was driven by the fear that socialists and communists were taken over the country. And there was a time around the First World War that there were uh, mayors elected in local government who were communists. That's inconceivable now. So it started in the Republican Party in the 1950s, and it becomes slow, slowly stronger and st stronger. 
So I mentioned the Malik manual because it scares me that people are appointed in career civil service positions, not because of their expertise and their professionalism, their knowledge, but because they are loyal to the one in power, in this case, the president. Wow. And in career civil service positions, you can do a lot of harm. Um, the Powell memorandum is simply fanning the fears of Americans as that the free market is under stress. Well, is the free market under stress when governments provide care for those who cannot care for themselves? I explain in class, socialism is A, not the same as communism, and B, we have to keep in mind that socialism is about caring for those who cannot care for themselves. Young children who are orphaned, very elderly people, and people who are physically or mentally handicapped. If that's socialism, fine. I have no problem with that. If you are a 20-year-old drug addict, I'm going to try and help you get off it, and I'll give you a broom and you can sweep the streets. Or I'll give you the means to study for a diploma and become a, a productive citizen. Yeah? So socialism, the way Americans think about it, is not about handouts. It's about helping those who are not in a position to help themselves. So the Malik Manual 71 and the Powell Manual, there is um, Newt Gingrich's contract for America that continued doing harm. There are rec um, Ronald Reagan's tax cuts, were, which were ridiculous. Huh? Um, some Republicans think in terms of starving the beast, and the beast in their eyes is then government. Now, why do you think I made that distinction between physical and imagined communities? Yeah. Can we really trust each other well enough in a society with, well, the United States is 320 million people and counting. Um, how much is Brazil? 130, 140 million? 200, 200 million? 200 million people. Do we really trust everybody else to keep us safe? Even if it's only 1% of the population that rapes, that murders, that molests children, that are committing heinous crimes. We need a government because we no longer know one another. Societies, urbanized societies with the densely populated communities in which we live cannot function without a government. And we may not like it, but in order to pay for this, we have to pay taxes. Yeah? And when I go home this afternoon, I'm pretty sure I'll get home safe. I'll drive my car on the road. People will obey the red light. Uh, yeah, I'll be safe. Um, uh, to me, America does feel a little less safe than the Netherlands. That has something to do with gun control or lack of it. Uh, but in imagined communities of people, uh, we need a government to make sure that there are not some crazies who do things harm others and harm others' privacy. So that's a long answer to your thought, but yeah. Does that address what you were? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I guess Professor Claret has a, a question for you. Okay. Yes, good morning, Professor Hatschelders. It's just a great pleasure to hear your wonderful uh, presentation. And of course, our heads are spinning, spinning with ideas. And I have some questions. I try to make only three, maybe. One of them, when we talk about uh, uh, the big idea of democracy, how difficult it is to uh, to to show uh, the regular citizen the importance and the, the the complexity of this idea, the the political divide that we live today. This this us versus them, not we're together trying to, to build something uh, uh, for everybody, a, a common ground that is uh, uh, shared with us. And uh, you talked about uh, the importance for our survival as a species uh, mm -hmm. to cooperate, to share with others and care for others. And I've, I was wondering how can we think, that this is already a big problem in our countries, but the problems that we face today are global problems. You mentioned the, the COVID pa uh, pandemic. Uh, we have the climate change, the climate emergency that we are uh, living. So uh, how can we build trust in a, a higher level? Is, is, is it possible to think about these um, uh, so urgent problems uh, that, that demands a global 
uh, governance in these moments of uh, challenging of our democracies as, as state uh, nations? This will be the, the, the one okay. question. Um, the other is sorry about these questions because really you no, really, no, it's fine, it's fine. Go, go, go. Uh, the second one is uh, when you talked about us, uh, uh, Homo sapiens as a, a conflicted species. Uh, uh, and the, our origins in the uh, chimpanzees and bonobos, how this our common ancestors behind them, uh, and the, the 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 elements that we bring from these two, uh, the, co the cooperative and the competitive, the community communal uh, organization versus individual organization. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, what do you think about uh, our um, uh, modern uh, civilization? Maybe we have. Uh, 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 put our uh, our bets on the chimpanzee way of life, of being individualistic. I, I prefer the bonobo way of life. I, <laughs> I particular me too. But uh, should we, uh, maybe you have going too much in this uh, chimpanzee heritage and not consider our need of community of cooperation of, of uh, uh, well these characteristics you have mentioned. And the last question. Uh, it's about uh, the education for democracy that you you, you mentioned in the end too. Uh, I think you are quite right. We need somehow to 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 address this issue, to to bring that big idea to the out to our, our lives uh, in the beginning of, of our education. Uh, but again, we are in an emergency now. How can we make this education uh, um, timing uh, uh, to the the, to the size of our uh, problems. Well, I was okay. by. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really, really. Uh, bo it's boiling my 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 ideas here. Thank you very much. Well, um, I have to tell you that it's based on a book that I did in 2020 with the University of Michigan Press, The Three Ages of Government, and there you'll see a lot more detail. Chapter three has a lot of references to the literature in primatology. And honestly, I came across it by accident. I never thought, you know, I studied history, right? And then public administration, right? I never thought of looking at primatology, but it seems that the way those primate societies or communities are organized is actually reflected in how we organize ourselves. So we have to look at them. You know? um, that book, by the way, is open access. So it doesn't cost you anything. No? Now, uh, democracy is a big idea, us versus them. You will recognize that us versus them is really important. Yeah? Uh, the Dutch, when there were still decent winters, right, and that we had ice uh, speed skating uh, competitions, and we were usually were competing with the Norwegians, right? So it's us versus them, and the Dutch want to win, right? I've heard jokes in the Netherlands and Belgium, where the Belgians tell the same joke, as the Dutch, but then the Belgian uh, makes the Dutch look stupid and the, the Dutch make the Belgians look stupid. And I've heard the same jokes, the same jokes, but then with Norway and Sweden, with Canada and the United States. So we have deeply embedded in us, us versus them. Now, whether it's primate communities or human societies, we tend to think in terms of us versus them. And it's very difficult for us to transcend and make the step to go beyond, this is my group of people and you are of a different group. That is especially visible when I think about the Netherlands with the influx of people from Turkey and Morocco in the middle of the 1960s. And I remember that I'm 67, right? So I remember that, that the neighborhood literally changed. I grew up in a labor class neighborhood. It was all white. And five years later, it was people from Northern Africa and the Middle East because there were we, we had jobs that needed to be filled. And so we invited people to come over. But society changes as a consequence. And you quickly see people congregating in the same neighborhoods where they see people from, we have it here in Columbus, people from Somalia. They live in a particular area in yeah, close to one another. And the, the, the step to go from us versus them to thinking about us as a global citizen as humanity is extremely difficult. So there are cleavages in pretty much every society, especially in societies that experience uh, high levels of immigration from other parts of the world. So in Europe, at the moment, we have plenty of people coming from the Ukraine. I'm actually writing an article with an undergraduate student on it. 
for a journal um, because he is of Ukrainian descent. His parents are Ukrainian and he worked in a, in a summer in a Ukrainian refugee camp in Mexico City uh, past summer. So I don't know, we, we, we were not working on that article. But Ukrainians are white and they're Christians. So they're more accepted in Dutch society and in other Western European societies than say Somalis or people from South Sudan. Yeah. Um, so the us versus them thing is a big problem. You see the same thing, um, especially among chimpanzees, so north of the Congo River, um, where uh, chimp communities attack another community, fighting for the same resources. Uh, we do the same thing. Um, democracy as a big uh, idea. And may I call you Antonio, sir, professor? Uh, eh? Sure. Professor. So call me Jos, eh, by all means. That's how I was baptized, Jos, Joseph. Um, Thank you. I think democracy is a really big idea because we don't quite understand it. Yeah? We have been for most of our existence, as far as we know, fairly egalitarian. Then all of a sudden, when we shift into living in imagined communities, we cannot be but hierarchical. And we think that the best way to keep everybody safe is to have one person at the top with a ruling elite and they can basically exploit everybody else. There is a book here at the Law Library that I uh, read a few years ago, how pretty much all uprisings against authority were tax revolts the past 5,000 years. Think of the French Revolution, the American Revolution as a tax revolt that had, went way out of hand. Yeah? The experience we have with running large scale democracy and Woodrow Wilson, who in the United States is claimed to be the father of PA, which is just a whole lot of bull, uh, in my view, anyway, we, we have much older PA traditions in Europe and even that much older in China and in India. Right? Um, um, large scale democracy, I think we're still experimenting with. And that has to do with the fact, and I mentioned that in my talk, that, that anthropologists and evolutionary biologists, they happen to be husband and wife, by the way, say that our, our modern skulls house an, a Stone Age mind. That is, we're very good living in small communities because we know each other, we recognize each other by face. Yeah. Uh, but large scale, uh, Woodrow Wilson did say, it's easier to write a constitution than to run one. So I went off with that thought. Uh, we are still learning how to run a constitution in a democracy. And 240 years, yeah. Uh, to me and to you, that sounds like a long time. Yeah. So I tell students, I have three quarters of my life behind me. I have, if I'm lucky, a quarter left. Right. And they kind of look at me like, oh, whoa, whoa, what's this guy saying here? Well, this is just a fact of life. Huh? Um, so 240 years sounds like a lot. But if you look, uh, take the time span of human existence, it's nothing. So no wonder that we still have this situation that some crazies, and I call them crazies. Yeah. They try to grab power and it's not visible to all those followers that they do it for themselves, not for anyone else. else. So that's why um, it's a big idea. We haven't quite figured out yet. And I'm bound to be rational, just like you are. So, you know, hey, how to deal with global problems. At the moment, there's a conference going on with uh, between the seven states. And it's, I believe, in Texas, that conference. Between the seven states who um, in the United States who depend upon the Colorado River for water, that is water for people, citizens in their house, and water for agriculture, right? Even between these seven states, and they're all in America, so that's uh, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Texas, California, let's not forget California, very, and Nevada. Yeah? Even those seven states within one country cannot seem to come to an agreement on how to reduce water intake from the Colorado River. And if we keep consuming it up to the levels that we have in the past, the uh, federal government will have to step in and say, okay, this is the amount of water you can get, and that's it. Um, global problems, think of the garbage patches in the oceans. Huh? They're just floating around, gyrating in the Pacific, Southern and Northern Pacific Ocean, 
the southern and northern Atlantic Ocean, in the Indian Ocean. No one is cleaning it up. Um, yeah, global governance. Look at the European Union. I don't need to tell you that Hungary, uh, you know, is a member of the European Union. But is Hungary abiding by this universal declaration of human rights? No. Is Poland? Well, they try to, but it's not easy to shake off your, even though it was only, it was less than a century, your communist past. How to deal with global problems? Yes, it requires global governance. But then the question also becomes, do we want a global government the way George Orwell wrote about it in 1984? Or Aldous Huxley in, uh, in uh, oh gosh, what was the book? I forgot the title. A world, one world government. That's kind of a scary thought too. And if you think about the fact that say a few thousand years ago, there were thousands upon thousands of independent jurisdictions across the globe. Right now, the entire globe, except for Antarctica, is part of a jurisdiction, a nation, a, a national state. I call it a territorial state, yeah? territorial state. Um, so there's roughly 196 of them. Most of them are members of the United Nations. Some are not that they have uh, an auditor status, say Palestinians and uh, the Vatican. Um, so that's a heck of a lot less, fewer jurisdictions than in the past. So global governance, I'm not so sure. If we cannot agree at a local or regional level, I'm not sure we can so easily agree at an international level. And we'll just have to wait and see because we have never dealt with something like this. Your... Um, Third comment about common ancestry in the modern way of life. I don't think it would hurt to take a look at ourselves, not as rational beings who are on top of the food chain, which is something the Enlightenment threw upon our backs, right? but actually as primates as well, with rather animal instincts that prevent us from transcending uh, that part of our ancestry. And I think that education is possible for them. Now, I went to a teacher's college at the, in Delft because I thought I was going to be a high school teacher. Yeah, first. Uh, history and textiles. So I have a degree in Nelson to teach knitting, weaving, sewing, and board. I make clothes for my mom and sisters, right? Yeah. And I still do uh, some stuff with it. Um, that curriculum that I saw to my great delight is really well adapted to the various grade levels. You can actually teach children to be kind to one another and not to vilify someone because their skin color is different. And you can up that education in civic sensibility. It's, it, it's an American-based project, but it's got 300 people who worked on it. And as a, originally a school teacher, I can tell you this looks pretty good. And you can adapt it to the needs of Brazil or Argentina or South Africa or China, if you will. Uh, they could use some of that. So I do think it's possible, but I also think it should be a standard element in curriculum. Not because I think my study, public administration, your study, our study is more important. No, civics is vital to a democracy. In an authoritarian system, I don't think it's vital because people simply accept the hierarchy as is and you accept your station in life, you're a subject. Well, in a democracy, you need to be educated what it means, and you can, you can increase that. Just as you increase with arithmetic, first you learn your numbers, in second grade you learn to add and subtract, in third grade you learn to multiply and divide, right? You can do that with civics and citizenship as well. My students are baffled. I teach the intros, intro for undergrads and the intro PA for graduates, right? They're baffled when they hear about democracy, when they hear me talk about things that they have never heard, if at all they get an education in civics. I did, but that was part of the history curriculum and that was only the stamps, flags and coins. So I hope that that will change and that change is the best when it is bottom up. And with bottom up in this case, literally, you start early. If people are 18 and they come into my intro PA for undergraduates and they haven't heard about this, I've had plenty of students who say that their parents are very different views about government, that government is a swamp to be, to be drained and that Trump should be president. 
And then after a semester, yes, I hear. There are some students who will say I'm a radical, right? Most students will say, oh my goodness, is that the case? Have I been told wrong? Have I been given fake information? Because I like to think I go by facts, yes. And I, they all know about me. I was a member of the Labour Party in the Netherlands. Yeah? And I was active. I was pretty young, but I was active. So that tells you where I stand. But that doesn't mean I impose my views upon them. If you're a Republican, I have no problem with that. As long as we're both willing to talk and listen and find some kind of a consensus. But, you know, the Netherlands is one of those consensus democracies. So, um, I, I, it, and, and we have, you know, Geert Wilders is a right-wing politician who blondes his hair <laughs> and has a bodyguard because he's afraid he's going to get shot. But he spouts all sorts of yeah, conspiracy theories about people from other parts of the world who've come to the Netherlands for refuge. So you help people out. That's what you do. Yeah, you hit upon a really big problem, us versus them. I don't think anyone has figured it out how to deal with that and how to become truly a global citizen. And I tell people, ah, we still think, tend to think too much in terms of the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, I do to you what you did to me, and we forget about the New Testament. When people call themselves Christians in the United States, they said, what do you mean? Do you love your neighbor like yourself? No, very disappointing. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> you touch it by all things, fellow, that I haven't quite figured out myself. I can talk about it, um, um, and it may be a good thing that I'm not uh, a president. <laughs> yeah. Although, I would make uh, civics and uh, civility education mandatory for all grades. Yeah. That's about it. So, yeah. This is more of a conversation than an answer to a particular question because you had all sorts of thoughts running through your head and I have the same thing. You know, it just keeps spinning back and forth. And, oh yeah. so Thank I you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks a lot, Professor. Uh, we have some questions from our audience here at the Zoom room, and also from the YouTube channel. Uh, I'll forward you the first question. Uh, it was posed by Anna Claudia, and she's, uh, the, the thing is, she was, she has some curiosity on what you told in the, in the, the last piece of the, the lecture on the distrust in institutions and the trust in the market. Uh, how could we, is it possible, and how could we restore trust in the institutions after all that has happened in the last year, either in the US and in Brazil? A deep sigh first, right? Because this is not an easy question. And I have something of an answer. It may not be satisfactory. I've been wondering about it as well. Huh? Um, one thing we know from literature in developmental psychology is that when people start talking with each other as human beings, they, after, say, five, ten minutes or so, start seeing the other human being as a human being, the other person. No longer as a person with, say, a particular skin color or a particular religion. So once people get to know each other, they look beyond the superficial differences, physically visible in skin color, uh, but then there are differences in political outlook, in religious affiliation, and so forth, right? linguistic differences. So when people talk with one another, they see beyond those differences and then recognize, whoa, we're all part of the human race. Now, I am thinking of 
the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that Nelson Mandela started. And I remember watching his inaugural speech uh, when he was um, established as the president of South Africa in 1994. And I remember that I got goosebumps when he said something along the lines of, um, this is a country for black and for white folks. And the only way that we can deal with what happened in the past and there is deep distrust between blacks and whites in Af South Africa, I've been there, um, is when we start talking to each other. And when we say, okay, let's step away from the past and let's see how we can create a new South Africa. Well, that lasted for a little bit. And now the divisions are again pretty deep in South Africa. Mandela is dead and his legacy is apparently down the drain, right? But I think that talking with one another is actually really helpful. So maybe we should set that up uh, here in OSU. I have to think about it a bit. If we set up meetings between people who, uh, and there's, there's a, a Republican student association, there's a Democratic student association, that we get these people from both sides together, start talking with each other, and then see, oh, wait a minute, not all Republicans are Trumpers which is the case, yeah? Um, there are divisions in Brazil as well. And honestly, I know that this answer is possibly not satisfactory, but I don't know what there is that we can do to get beyond the divisions that exist at the moment. And, you know, it was 10 years ago that the Supreme Court still had the highest level of trust of all public institutions. Right now, it's in the single digits. That happened in a decade. And it's not just Roe v. Wade, although that you may have heard about it in Brazil, that the current Supreme Court overturned the 1973 decision that made abortion legal in the United States. Pretty big deal here. Um, I have nothing else to offer. It's a really important question, but saying, people, please talk with each other so that you can see. My students know that I'm a lefty, right? But they also know that I respect their opinions and I listen to them because that's the only way that we can survive. That, that's that's all I have. Maybe there are other people who have uh, thoughts about that, things that I didn't think about because I'm not omniscient, huh? clear, boundary rational. I, I was just I was just recalling when my kids went to school, um, we had really to teach them not to be mean and also they had to learn how to be kind with the the oh, with the other ones i've seen that children can be so cruel and they don't even know what drives it uh, teenagers especially they are mean they are oh mean. they're mean they're mean yeah. okay uh, we have another question from our zoom audience uh, Almir Nascimento, uh, he's, he's taken from the point on the, the contradiction between the fact that we live in, in well, the way we live, uh, technology has made possible that we can communicate with anyone in real time anywhere in the world, but on the downside, and his uh, surprisingly, uh, this easy communication has also deepened the the divide between us, and also has also buttered but uh, some polarization of ideas. And how could we uh, how could we start finding a way? to rebuild the bridge for, you know, for a dialogue. And how can we talk, how can we think about the, the strengthening of democracy and uh, a state of law in, in these conditions? Very good question. Let me see. I will tell you a little story to illustrate. 
I think one of the problems with social media at the moment is that communication is very quick. And as a consequence, it is so quick that people actually not always think about what it is that they're actually doing or writing. Um, it takes a little bit of time to think through what you're saying and then come up with something that is sensible rather than something that's off the cuff and impulsive. So the, the speed of social communications now is such, so fast. And one sociologist called it uh, the width of social time is seconds. We're communicating here, two hours time difference between Brasilia and Columbus. Um, we have direct interaction. I think the transmission is less than a second. You can see me in real life. And I see you in real life. Uh, um, when you write a text, a quick text, or you do something, uh, you often do it without thinking. And I'm afraid our thinking processes are a little slower than what technology allows us to do, which is fast communication. Now, let me give you an example. Um, in my intros, Students will have to write a paper every week, about one page, two pages, wherein they apply what they learn in class and from the readings and lecture to something that they see happen in the world around them. And that's how I hear from kids who are 20 what's going on in their world. Now, my kids are grown. I'm a grandfather, so I have two grandchildren, right? Um, but I don't hear what's going on in the minds of people who are 20 at the moment. Okay. So that's how I learned things that I didn't know existed. So six, seven years ago, in one of the papers, I read the paper. Seriously? It was about sexting. And I had never heard about sexting. And I asked some students, I pick some students every week to present their paper before class and have a class discussion on the topic. So we talk about, yes, 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 sexting was quite common. Seriously? I had no idea. So I listen to what the students have to say. I say, okay, now think about the following. 1955, the year that I was born. You are madly in love with someone else. And to show your, how much you love him, her, you make a photograph of your private parts. And uh, you are fortunately enough that you have a dark room at home because obviously you cannot take the film roll to a photographer to develop it. So you develop the photograph of yourself, make sure there's sufficient contrast, it's black and white. And uh, meanwhile, you write a letter on the envelope, you write the address down, and you put stamp on it, and I put a photo in with the little text, this is how much I love you. You walk from your house to the mailbox, Put it in the mailbox. Would you do that? And to a T, every student said no. I said, why? So I let the silence fall. Right? That's me. And I let the silence fall. And then someone said, well, there is so much time that passed between making the photo and mailing it. So there was time to think about what I was doing. That's it. Eh? With our fast communication, we don't take sufficient time to think. Now, I may be sounding like an old fart, but which I'm not. But we do need time to think things through before we act. And with social media, we write things. I find it with emails. I'm very careful with what I email, not because I am um, paranoia, but because I think I have to think before I say things. And sometimes an email may come across to me as, hmm, do you really mean that? And then I'll email back, is this what you meant? Or do you mean something different? That the words you chose were somewhat awkward or, you know, and English is my second language. I know German, French, English, and Dutch, right? And I know a little Spanish because I had one year of Spanish. But uh, to express yourself um, exactly as you want to be understood, 
is extremely difficult. And with 140 digits, it's almost impossible. So my answer is, we need time to think before we act or speak. So talking with one another, going back to uh, Antonio, uh, Professor uh, Antonio Claret's question, yeah? speaking before we think, if we listen to other people, we get to understand them and look beyond their skin color, their affiliation politically, religiously, and so on and so forth. So to me, it's wow, that's even more important to listen is more important than to talk. Yeah. And digest what people say. So I hope this is an answer to the question of the individual. Thanks um, a lot. Allow me to get um, a little bit of coffee. I have a coffee can. So colleagues are walking in. I make coffee early in the morning for them. So okay. I, I want a cup of coffee. Just a sec. Okay. Uh, bom. Para quem está nos ouvindo pelo YouTube... Well, for né? those of you who are listening to us on YouTube, next we're going to um, ask the questions of Gladson, Laís, Robson, and Alice. So if you have any other questions, please, you can send them to us that we are going to translate and we're going to send this. Ready for another round of questions? Oh, sure. Okay. Um, it's only 8 to 11, so it's only quarter to 10 here. So with you, it's a quarter till 12? Yeah, yeah quarter yeah. to 12. It's all here. good. It's fine. Okay. Um, Gladson Pompeo is asking you, with the continuous growth of actors in and around government and the subsequent difficulty to identify who can be held accountable how do you see the role of go digital government, or government digital transformation to help build stronger accountability and democracy? Um, I think accountability is possible when we keep track of all communications and all uh, paperwork, so to speak. So in the past, uh, I know that in Europe, uh, things have been archived since the Middle Ages. Yeah, official communication. So letters from local governments to citizens and vice versa. Um, if there is a paper trail or an electronic trail, um, you can hold people accountable that no documentation of official action is destroyed. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a difference between having information and communications digitized or having them in paper. It's all about the evidence trail. And as long as there's no chain broken in the evidence trail, people can be held accountable. Now, the problem, of course, is that even if we have a paper trail, it is almost impossible to say that one individual or one organization can be held accountable for, say, mismanagement of a particular policy. Now, why is that? Um, 12 years ago, Jody Sanford had in the Journal of uh, Public, what is it, JPAN? Journal of Public uh, Administration and Management, an article that was on policy fields. There was a time, and I'm pretty sure the same is the case in Brazil, that a lot of services were offered at the local level. That's why public administration as a study emerges, actually, or re-emerges, I should say, at the local level in the United States, in the Netherlands, in Western Europe in general, in the late 1800, in the late 19th century. And it was local government administrators that responded to citizen requests for government intervention for better housing, better sanitation, better health care, uh, better labor laws, so against child labor, etc. That trickles upward. But right now, if you look at policy, if you look at policies as a field, it is a field that is populated by a variety of actors. Now, Jody Sanford, and she's now a dean of a program in uh, Washington State, uh, PA uh, College, um, wrote about early childhood education in Minnesota. And that's ages 
my daughter is a, is a teacher in early childhood education. So ages three to six, eight, thereabouts, right? So kindergarten plus grades one and two. And if you look at that policy map that she made for early childhood education, you see actors in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors at the local, regional, and national, in the case of America, federal level, right? So there is not one actor responsible for the entire policy of early childhood education. There are multiple actors involved. Now, who to hold accountable for something that goes wrong is almost impossible. And that is also a challenge of democracy. Maybe we could designate a particular organization uh, accountable, say the Department of Education. But should there be the Department of Education at the state level? or the federal level, or the school board at the local level. That's why democracy is a challenge, because so many actors are involved, and rightfully so, involved in developing policy. Now, those policy fields, folks, exist not just for early childhood education, right, but for the defense industry, the transportation industry, the road maintenance, uh, for parks and recreation, for water supply. <laughs> It's just, yeah. And that everything then still works hmm? with so many different actors and so many different public, nonprofit, and private agencies and units is nothing short of amazing. And uh, Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, would have gotten the Nobel Prize had he lived for what he called spontaneous coordination. Just like Herbert Simon got his Nobel Prize in eco Economics for Bounded Rationality. Spontaneous coordination. We still don't quite know how that works, but that would be my answer at the moment. So it's not just holding people accountable as individuals for what they say and do. That was a sexting story, right? That we needed time to think, but at the moment accountability is also difficult because democratic societies are not run in a top-down manner. It is, um, top down and bottom up. There is continuous interaction and feedback loops. Yeah. So I hope that answers the question or addresses it to, to some degree. Yeah, I'm sure you, you gave him something to think about. Uh, Laís Marayo is asking you uh, about the role about the role of social media in democracy and in its weakening. How do you think governments or society can control misinformation in a democratic way? You know, it amazes me when my wife and I go out to dinner uh, that you see people in a restaurant uh, texting and on their phone and not talking with one another. Right? I've seen people text in the car while driving. I see people text students here on campus. They don't look at one another. They look at their stupid phone. I see people in meetings taking their cell phone to the meeting. Now, I've turned mine off, so it's not on. I won't be disturbed. I will not take my phone to the meeting because a message comes in and I'm immediately looking. I know that inclination, we all have it. So I'm not taking it to the meeting because in the meeting, if it's in person, you're meeting people. So you're looking at people, not at your stupid phone. Yeah. Um, the problem with social media is some psychologists argue that it has widened the distance between people because it is seen as a means of communication that is sufficient. But it's not, because people do not get to know each other beyond the visible, very superficial differences between males and females and between people of different ethnic background, right? So where the Tocqueville could write in Democracy in America that he wrote, quote unquote, democracy loosens social ties, that was particular to the United States when he wrote it. Because what he saw was that people have to fend for themselves in and believing that no one else will come to their aid. 
And in that sense, he believed democracy loosened social ties. Well, social media have done even worse. They loosen social ties. Siblings <laughs> communicate with each other with a stupid phone. I mean, what is this? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's nice. I have on my phone, uh, I have on my phone, yeah, something that is called family album, where my daughter posts the photographs of the grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, I have on my phone Facebook. My daughter put it there so that I can see it, but I don't post anything on Facebook. I don't do Twitter. I've never sent a tweet. And I consciously don't do that because people can reach me. Yeah. So there was a colleague coming in to get some coffee. <laughs> um, uh, people can reach me via email. Yeah. And uh, ResearchGate. And uh, I, I respond sometimes when people want um, a copy of something that I've written. I said, look, here's my email. If I have a PDF, I'll send it to you via email. Because if, you know, I have colleagues, so Trevor Brown, the dean here, I don't know how many emails he gets in a day, but there's a lot of your day lost on just responding to emails if you don't watch out. Um, and that diminishes the amount of time that we have to think. Now, fortunately, when I was 20, you have to go to the library. Uh, and I do like it that things are at my fingertips here behind my desk. But I still like going to the library to sniff at the books and take the books off the shelf and walk by and say, wow. There's a book I never even heard of. That's interesting, you know. So uh, I think social media has widened social ties, has limited the connections that people that we're wired to make because we need to survive. And as an individual, you see my hands, I don't have claws. I don't have the speed of a cheetah. I don't have the teeth of a saber-toothed tiger. So what do I have to defend myself? I'm walking upright. Do you know how much safer it is to walk on your hands and feet? Because you're the most vulnerable parts of your body, from your lungs, your heart, your throat, your genitals, are protected from immediate attack. We're walking upright. We're extremely vulnerable. So, yeah. Yeah, social media widens social ties. And when I see husbands and wives on their phone and not talking with each other and thinking, seriously? <laughs> but I am maybe from, well, no, I am from the previous century. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I remembered one friend of mine, uh, his son, her son was in the, you know, the teenage, the first teenage uh, years. And it shocked her to see that to talk with her son, she had to text him. He was in the other room and she called him and he didn't come. But if she texted him, he would answer. That's where colleague, we are. I have a colleague right next door to mine, Rob Greenbaum. I'm the associate dean for faculty. He's the associate dean for curriculum, right? And just for speed of communication, he's... Uh, what, 15 years younger than I am, he emails me next door, right? Hey, your sir, and then has a question, right? So I just get up from my office, walk the distance of, what is it, five meters, stick my head around his office door, say, hey, Rob, uh, in response to your email. <laughs> That's what I do it's, here, too. I rather go to the room of my colleagues and talk yeah, to them than yeah. just email them. Yeah. It's a uh, weird world. We have another question here. Yeah, go for it. Uh, we have seen an exponential rise in the use of artificial intelligence by governments to support and implement policies, in many cases with little to no transparency of algorithms, parameters, and criteria put in place, thus making it even harder to ensure accountability. Any thoughts on the implications of this scenario for the future of democracy? If you want to take a, a deep sigh, it's okay. If I want? If you want to take another deep sigh, it's okay. 
No. <laughs> yeah. You know, it is a heck of a lot easier to study the past when whatever happened in the past is over and done with and there's sufficient distance in time to study it. And we know that historians have different opinions about, say, the causes or theories of the Second World War, the First World War, of take your pick. Yeah. And uh, we continuously fashion, uh, according to new trends, new sensibilities, how we wish to remember our history. So at the moment, a big challenge in history class in the United States is the extent to which you can talk about slavery. Okay. And how there are some, there's a governor in Florida who believes that critical race theory should not be taught, which basically means that you're saying that a teacher should teach you what to think and not how you can think. And what teachers have to do is teach students how they can think and that the students will see that you as a teacher are not imposing your beliefs upon them but that you're exposing them to a range of beliefs that will help them understand better their own belief, as well as respect the beliefs of others, right? So at the moment, I think, and I write very much as an historian, I'm a professor of public administration. This is my 40th year. Uh, I think I'll go another five or six because of the journal, right? Uh, and I like what I do. It's physically not exerting. It's intellectually highly appealing to continue doing this for a number of years. Uh, and teaching is about how you can think and not what you should think. At the moment, if I put my historian's hat on, I don't have sufficient distance in time to answer your question. Um, if I look back, and that's why I had um, a little text in the paper on the changes in local government between say 1880 and 1920, which is the time, and I can show that in graphs, that government starts growing quite rapidly in terms of personnel size, in terms of revenue and expenditure, in terms of organizational differentiation, and in terms of the balance between primary and secondary law. It's just off the charts. Uh, since then. And it's been, uh, for most of history, it's kind of like this government growth, and then whoosh, all of a sudden, there you go. For whatever indicator we take, that's what we see. Um, I think there is sufficient capacity in democracy to believe that democracy will be all right. This is, but I'm not treating what happened in the United States, and I drove to a cousin who lives here in Columbus with my wife and uh, one and daughter past the state house here in Columbus. And there were two young kids. I mean, you know, young people, 25 or so with a red t-shirt, t-shirt, uh, MAGA, and with a machine gun in their hands. And there were a lot of police officers too, who did nothing. And it scared the hell out of them. Because, you know, what prevents them just from shooting? Um, I would say I think, but I probably will have to say I hope that democracy is strong enough to overcome the extent to which some Americans in leadership position believe that they can manipulate democracy to their interests and shape it to serve their lust for power, and that those who followed blindly as cattle will see that they have been duped. And um, but I don't have enough. I, I hope I'll live long enough to see that democracy was strong. I wonder what people in Brazil are thinking after January 8th. You know, there was a heck of a lot more damage done in your capital than there was in the United States uh, Capitol building. Uh, but it is scary to see because keep in mind eh, that the French Revolution was started by a few hundred, that's all, a few hundred angry farmers marching up to Paris from the Vendée in southwestern France. And it spilled over. 
and it spilled over. And the consequences of that are still felt across the globe. This establishment or this effort to establish large scale democracy. You know, and just for the heck of it, Napoleon instituted the first to sixth grade system in elementary schools, and that translated into secondary schools. So some of those reforms are pretty lasting. Yeah. It doesn't take too many people to topple the regime. So it doesn't, it doesn't, by analogy, it may not even take that many people to topple a democracy, unless the people rise. So that, that will be my answer. I'll have to see how it plays out. I'm looking to the 2024 presidential elections in the United States, see what support Trump manages to get. It seems to be eroding, but I don't know how to understand the news reports, whether they are influenced by hope rather than by knowledge effects. And so I, so I wonder, as a counter question, um, how people in Brazil are thinking. Is there a, a, a large following for Bolsonaro? Uh, or is it, it may be too early to tell whether that's eroding or not. Yeah, it will be interesting to learn. As you said, uh, let's wait for it. We'll, mm. have, we'll have local elections next year. And mm. that will be uh, a first milestone. Barometer to see what is going on with the, you know, with the authoritarian thought in, in Brazil. Uh, by the way, we have another question here from Robinson Pitelli. Um, there are a large parts of Brazil where you don't really have a democratic rule of law. And that includes places like Nova Iguaçu on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro. And also some places where the former government had uh, no, uh, a firm, um, let's say, a firm constituency. Um, okay. And you have a different kind of government, almost authoritarian, in parts of the Amazon, where indigenous rights are violated all the time. How to deal with those situations? It's a million dollar question. Uh, no kidding. Um, the rule of law in terms of political theory is one where the people are defined as the sovereign, where sovereignty is embedded in the population as a whole, as a citizenry but where the individual citizen is subject to the rule of law. That would include the head of state, the head of government and any other official. Um, we know that in all countries, people are not equal under the law because of that us versus them thinking. African-Americans are in a um, pretty nasty situation in the United States where the law doesn't treat them as equals and where they have less access to resources that according to the law should be distributed evenly among whites and blacks. Black women have an even greater problem. Uh, just look at the wage gap. Now, if you look at the United States or Brazil for that matter, if you look at the big cities, and I have been to Rio de Janeiro, I was there at a conference in 1985, I got robbed by two kids on a scooter who took my little bag with pipes. I, I used to smoke a pipe. Um, they just whizzed by and rip, ripped it out of me, thinking Western tourist, a lot of money, right? So <laughs> what they found were tobacco, my pipe stomper, and two or three pipes. But I could see from the hotel was on Ipanema Beach. I could see a favela in the distance. And I can see that there are neighborhoods. I know there are neighborhoods in Brazil. I know there are neighborhoods in South Africa, where the police will not enter, and where the rule of law is the rule of whatever group claims power there. Maybe they're rival gangs. And in the United States, the same is the case, yeah? with uh, neighborhoods a little less and are still policed by the police or get special attention from the police, but where there are other groups who seek to have 
uh, yeah, an extra exercising authority of their own. Now, Brazil is a pretty big country. And when you mentioned the Amazon, look, the exploitation and suppression of Native Americans is probably no different from that of um, um, the indigenous population in the Amazon, right? I think the farther away you are from the capital, the less it is possible for the capital to exercise effective oversight um, over governments that have jurisdiction over parts of the Amazon area. We all read in the Western world, I'm sure, about uh, what, how much was it? How many football fields a year disappear in the Amazon just to make room for agriculture, right? Um, and those forests are chopped down. The profits go into private pockets, as far as I as far as I hear. Um, I don't know how to change it other than saying, can we develop a system of effective oversight for remote areas? Because the further remote you are, the more you can do whatever you like. Now, there's one thing that um, in historic empires worked. Think the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, the English Empire. The further away um, a jurisdiction was, or a part that you're governing as part of your empire is, the more you rely on the locals to administer themselves as long as it is guaranteed that they pay their share in taxes. So ancient empires, the Romans did not institute or impose their uh, multi-divinity uh, religion or religious beliefs upon people in the Roman Empire. They were allowed to have their own beliefs. So I have no other answer for this question for this individual, but to find somehow a balance that works between centralization and decentralization. Remote areas, you can only administer remotely, but a sure, well, maybe that's it, that you appoint people of whom you know that they are not lured by a sense of greed and a sense of power, but truly want to serve people there. Maybe you need to appoint people in the Amazon from different parts of Brazil, not from the area itself. I don't know. I have to think about that a little more. And equality before the law on paper, it sounds lovely, but I don't think there has ever been a society where that truly was de facto the case. De jure, great. De facto, 1984. Some pigs are more important than others. As always, um, Alice Rodriguez is asking you, uh, is it possible to say that there is an open government model in execution faithful to strategy in any country. Say that again? I didn't quite get it. Is it possible uh, to say... Is it possible to say that there is an open government model in execution faithful to strategy in any country? Now, I've heard of the term open government, right? Is that the same as a government that tries to be transparent about its actions online? Yep. Hmm. Um, something similar to the American Freedom of Information Act has been passed around the 1970s in most Western countries. Yeah? Um, the stronger democracy is one where government is as transparent as it can be about its actions, with probably the exception of national security issues. And that's not just American, that is also Scandinavian and Dutch and German and Chinese, right? National security interests will always be secret. And I think that's okay. Um, the extent to which open government is established in countries is probably a little better in strong democratic societies and strong democratic societies are those where the rule of law is respected by the majority of the people 
where people recognize that law is negotiable, so that authority is negotiable. And with that, I mean, you saw that in one of my PowerPoints, that people know that law is set, and then we act according to the law. But 10 years from now, things may change, and then you have to adapt the law. So in the Netherlands, Americans have a constitution that goes back to 1789 or 1787, and then a batch of amendments. But the constitution itself is set in stone. It's almost sacrosanct. In the Netherlands, I tell students that we had our first constitution in 1798, another 1801, 1803, 1805, 1811, 1813, uh, 1828, that was the reform of the judicial system, 1848, 1883, and there was another one after the war, Second World War, and then the last constitutional revision was 1983. It took 20 years of legal scholars hashing out a new constitution that befitted the times. So the Dutch changed their constitution. Most European countries do that in answer to changing times. And that is a, a pretty open process with jurists and with parliamentarians, with political scientists and such folk. Um, open government is much less the case in countries that to more or lesser degree are governed um, in an authoritarian manner. And in authoritarian governments, people are not taught what it means to be a citizen. They're simply taught administrative skills uh, and uh, taught about the government of their country as probably the best in the world, right? Uh, but uh, something about citizen rights is, I don't think, taught. So civic civility is a characteristic for a country, teaching that. It's characteristic for a country where freedom of speech is an important value. So open government is also a government that accepts the freedom of speech. Uh, and when I ask students, would you like to live in North Korea? They all say no. Can you tell me why? Yeah, and then they start thinking, oh, yeah, hmm, not so bad here. Um, so I know this is pretty much a non-answer, and I apologize for that, but um, strong democracies have a government that is as open as can be about what is expected of you as a citizen and as a taxpayer. Thanks a lot, Professor. Um, it's already a quarter past noon. Uh, I think it's time for us to start slowing down, but um, there are still one question here. And mm -hmm. that's the final question. Okay, fine. Uh, it's, oh, it's from our Zoom audience. It's Claudio. Um, he thank you. He thanks you for the, the presentation. And he says, as the history of democracy points out, it was abandoned by societies for a long period until it resurfaced and proliferated in the 20th century. Currently, as commented, we can observe the rise of authoritarian governments and political movements, the mentioned increase of anti-democratic sentiments, mm -hmm. and still the prevalence of complex, complex threats that seem to have democrat, democracy, uh, democr democracy as target. Terrorism and violent extremism, cyber and biological crimes, cross-border crimes, etc. Thus, the deficiencies and imperfections of the democratic system seem, in a way, to weaken the states that adopt it. In view of the above, I ask, there comes the question, would it be possible to conclude that this decadence of the democratic system stems from the fact that people in current societies, mainly Western ones, are still not prepared in an evolutionary sense to experience democracy. That's a good one. And that goes the second one. So what kind of changes do you foresee that the democratic system will have to undergo in order to strengthen itself or even guarantee and there's something missing here claudio could you could you please fill it out 
okay, let's let's wrap it. It's continue to guarantee its continuity. Okay, let's wrap it out. Um, would it be possible to conclude that this decadence of the democratic system stems from the fact that people in current societies, mainly Western ones, are still not prepared in an evolutionary sense to experience democracy? What? Second one, what kind of changes do you foresee that the democratic system will have to undergo in order to strengthen itself and guarantee its continuity? And that's a wrap. Okay, very good question. Um, I don't think democracies are decadent. No? Uh, the way that uh, people became decadent in the late Roman Empire, which is why it fell. Um, I do think that people are complacent about democracy, not having not been educated about what it means in terms of citizen right and citizen duties, and what it means to be a citizen in a democracy and understand the position and role of government in society as one that serves the people and its elected office holders rather than is something that imposes from above upon people as subjects. So a great achievement of democracy is that we turn from as, uh, what's his name? Weber, not Max Weber, Alfred Weber, who wrote this book in 1975, Peasants into Frenchmen, describing the French Revolution leading up, and the, the, the decades leading up to the French Revolution. And then, so peasants into Frenchmen is basically subjects into citizens. Right. Um, now, I think I have a, a pretty easy solution, and people are not going to like it, to strengthening democracy. Now, remember the earlier question eh, about uh, equality before the law, so de jure, whereas in practice, de facto, will never be equal. I think that in answer to the question how to safeguard democracy, we recognize that on the one hand, it is still possible, that's part of our genetic makeup, that people simply follow a leader, like a herd-like animal, which is, I think, the case, and I hope I'm not offending anyone, the case with people who followed Bolsonaro, or who followed Trump, or who followed Adolf Hitler. Yeah, I put them in the same basket. And I apologize if that's not fair. Um, it may not be fair, certainly in the case of Bolsonaro. But um, lost my train of thought for a second, but I'll get it back. But to be a citizen is means that you transcend that animal type inclination. And there have been authors since the 17th century. Uh, John Maynard Keynes is one of them who writes that people are more dominated by their animal spirits than by their rationality, right? Now, how to strengthen democracy? Big question. I think it's very simple. And I have next to my office door, three quotes. One from Adam Smith, warning against what he called the tribes of monopoly. Now I've read a good part of the wealth of nations. And when I took the trouble to do that, it was six, seven years ago, I should have done 40 years ago. I read that he wrote more about the tribes of monopoly, about the danger that private industries get so much economic power and, and seek with their wealth to influence the legislature, than that he wrote about the free market. And we think that Adam Smith is a prophet of free market. No, he's not. He likes a regulated market. That's A. And then I have a quote by Oliver Wendell Holmes. He was an associate justice in the American Supreme Court in the early 20th century. When I pay taxes, I buy civilization. Now, I let that sink in a little. Because how do you do that? You don't do that, uh, buying civilization, by reducing taxation levels. When I tell students... Or when I ask students, what do you think was the marginal tax rate in the United States in 1960? Very, very few know it was 91%. Because how do you think the Second World War could be financed? And the generation of my parents is a generation that's still extremely grateful 
for the Canadians and the Americans liberating the country, right? Because it wasn't fun during there. Now, um, I think it is important to recognize, A, within our animal spirits that we are still accepting of people who take the lead and that some of us will follow. I think what people find as unfair are egregious differences in income levels. And the United States leads the pack in the world when it comes to differences in income levels. The tax cuts by Reagan and later by George Bush, number two, yeah, were tax cuts basically for the wealthy, the same with the tax cuts of Trump. Uh, the middle class is pretty much eroded in the United States. But your tax base is the say the labor class and the middle class that's the bulk of your citizenry the rich and very happy few is how many thousands of people maybe a million sounds like a lot but it isn't uh, so i think how to strengthen democracy is by reducing income inequality and have a system of progressive taxation yeah now that sounds socialist but even republicans or people on the right side of the spectrum must recognize that someone who makes, what is it, $40,000 a year, if they pay 30% of their income in Texas, that's a significant part of their income, $12,000. It's close to a quarter of their income, right? But someone who makes a million dollars a year, pays 30%, still has plenty left over to do other things with. Hence, a system of progressive taxation. And... There was this book by Jean Fourastier. I uh, have it in my references, Les Trente Glorieuses, The 30 Glorious Decennia, decades after the Second World War. When, and I mentioned it in my presentation, the first time in history, income inequality declined. That is also the first time that we truly have a middle class. Because I know there are some authors who write that there's a middle class in the 19th century emerging, and that is the case. Yeah? But um, a middle class, the way it emerged after the Second World War, and that book, it's not translated by Jean Fourastier. That's a bit of a pity. But, um, and you'll see in recent writing, uh, say Jean, uh, uh, Thomas Piketty, the French, uh, you know, uh, economist, that big, big book that my kids gave me for Christmas one year, uh, Capital. Yeah? How income inequality everywhere has increased. So people here feel that they're not getting a fair shake. They don't ask to be as rich as the top. They simply ask, I want a living wage. I want that there is a social safety net for those who do not have enough money to buy the medication or get the education that you want or need. That's the solution. It is, and it worked. It worked. And Fourastier made that pretty clear in a little book. That Trente de is worth 120 pages is all. Yeah, it worked. And it's amazing that people think that tax cuts will bring more money in their pocket. There's this little uh, little book in what happened in Kansas. How can people vote, you know, the rank and file, the labor classes? How can they vote for policies, in favor of policies that will actually harm them and that are peddled as this is a free country? It's a market. We are individualist society. So we cut taxes because we know you can take care of yourself. No, not everyone can take care of herself or himself the way Bill Gates can, or apparently Donald Trump. So yeah, that's the answer. It's a very simple answer. I know it works. I don't want to be as rich as Bill Gates. I'm just happy to be a professor. I have a nice salary. I'm not complaining, right? But there are a lot of people here who are hurting bad. And that's a powder keg in any democracy, because it just takes how many people to topple the regime? A few hundred. It was five or six hundred farmers in from the Vendée that started the French Revolution. I don't think many people know this. Yeah. So that's my answer. So I have no problem paying taxes because I do buy civilization. Thanks a lot, Professor. Um, now I'm turning to Portuguese. So I can 
address guys here in the room and also at the YouTube channel that are still there watching us. Uh, muito obrigado, pessoal, por Thank you guys for your presence. It was a massive presence for your questions. The questions were wonderful. Of course, uh, the professor helps a lot and the topic is very helpful, but your questions were very important. So this conversation was so interesting. So, and so interesting. So I'm gonna give the floor to Jane. She's a representative from the Ohio State University. Jane, please, can you make your final remarks? And also a tip for those that want to understand more about this partnership that we have. And don't forget, we're going to send you after this, um, maybe not today, but during the week, we're going to send you the article that the professor has um, that the professor has to be shared with you and also his presentation that was used today. That's it, guys. See you next time. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, everyone from ENAP for the opportunity to have Ohio State University participating in the event of this week with a professor. It was excellent. I'm very happy that you liked and participated through your questions. And for those of you who are interested to know more about uh, the collaborations between NAPI and Ohio State University, please write to me. I'm going to leave here at the chat my email and also the website from my office here in Brazil and also from the from the Ohio State University, from the uh, public policy. Uh, and you can also um, send me questions that you have. Uh, maybe you want to know about scholarships or similar events. Can I go? Can, uh, can anybody attend uh, any kinds of uh, programs or for doctor's degrees? And we're going to talk about it. And thank you so and much, Professor, for joining the, the, the event, for speaking today. It was an absolutely pleasure, pleasure to watch your presentation and uh, the conversations uh, that came with the questions from the audience. It was just amazing. Um, there was a time I was on YouTube and there were almost, what, 27, 25 um, folks watching. So this is really nice. I hope we can do something like that in person now. <laughs> Yeah, it's different in person. It's always different. It's always different in person. Uh, um último aviso para quem estiver nos assistindo. I have a last, uh, a last comment. If you, for those of you who are watching us, we have a um, public um, call that we are offering. We're going to share four subjects that are optional. And on those occasions, uh, we can receive students that are not necessarily from the public administration. Uh, the only thing is that uh, uh, we have in-person classes. So if you are here in Brazil, if you are interested to in participating in this, you can go through to the NAPS website. And you can see in the course web pages, you can see the public calls. Uh, if you don't find there, you can give us a call. You can get in touch with us through email and app.gov.br, and we can answer to you. Okay. I get you, Nate. Uh, and we hope we can meet in person and also that you can have another opportunity to, to talk to our students. Your last words? From me? Yep. Oh, it was truly a pleasure. I um, have, have done uh, a variety of talks in the course of my career. And um, this is the first time actually doing it via a Zoom. Um, I'm doing another one uh, in Turkey, also via Zoom in October, I believe. October. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But this was a pleasant experience. The only thing I uh, yeah, find a bit of a pity is I cannot see the people who had questions. You know, I cannot see their face 
whether my answer made sense to them or not. Or, and it seems almost as if there is mm, not as much opportunity for true interaction. You have a question, you have an answer, that's it. Um, I would love to see in a room people that also talking with one another, you know. So, but otherwise, this was a pleasant experience. So, thank you for inviting me. We thank you. Então é isso, pessoal. Para o pessoal que... So alunos... that's it, guys. For, those, for the new students that are going to be here at the NAP later on, we're going to meet at the event room on the second floor at 2 p.m. And for those that are going to just going to see the talks uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m., we're going to have the discussion of the book of the uh, Prof. Professor Mauro Silva, and also the doctor in uh, public policies uh, he organized and published at the IPEA. So that's it. I hope you have enjoyed so, as much as we have. And we are going to wait for you at the next opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye.